If you're a small to medium-sized business with a brand or trademark to protect, you'll want to define a strategy and plan to deal with the hundreds of new top-level domains being launched. Worst case scenario, a squatter registered your trademark or a competing and confusingly similar offering is launched. Stay tuned to learn what to do in this situation. I have three sponsor messages before we get into today's show. First, if you have a great domain name and nothing to show when people visit, you're missing out on potential advertising revenue, leads, and partnership opportunities. NicheWebsites.com can build you a site quickly with a price option to suit any need. But as their tagline says, they don't just build websites, they build businesses. NicheWebsites.com Second, if you're buying or selling a domain name or portfolio and you want an estimate of its value, estabot.com is the place to go. Just like you'd visit zillow.com to get an estimate of a house value, estabot.com provides key information about the most important statistics so you can make an informed decision based on data. Finally, whether you're buying, selling, brokering, or financing a domain name, you need an escrow company that's properly licensed, bonded, insured, and audited. That company is escrow.com, and they've been doing it since 1999. Escrow.com. It's about trust. Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Seiger, and I'm the publisher of DomainSherpa.com, the website where you can learn how to become a successful domain name investor and entrepreneur directly from the experts. I'm a small business owner, first and foremost. I own a few media properties, and each of those properties is a brand with a registered trademark that serves each specific audience. So when the news of the hundreds of new top-level domains was announced, a sense of dread came over me. How the heck am I going to register, pay for, and manage all these new domain names to protect my trademarks and brands, which was the strategy I was using until 2014 with .net, .org, .biz, and .info? Today, I'm interviewing someone who's an expert in this exact topic, and we're going to figure out what to do together. I'd like to welcome to the show Daniel Greenberg, director at Lex Synergy, a firm based in the United Kingdom with offices all around the world that specializes in domain name registrations, renewals, transfers, and management. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Great. Thank you for having me. So let me set the stage on the new top level domains. I know you and I have been in this space for, you know, a couple of years and we understand what's going on, but a lot of the audience and maybe a lot of entrepreneurs that are that are wrestling with this that may have done a search on Google or found this interview on on a social media platform may not know what's what's going on with the new top level domains. Top level domains are like .com, .net, .org, .info, .biz, which are the ones that most of us know about that have been out for years. But there's a whole new set of top-level domains that have been launched recently. How many new top-level domains have been launched in, you know, the past year or so, Daniel, and that are live today? There are about three, um, just over 300 that have been launched. So it's a fair number. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's added to the marketplace. So, yeah, so and, if, if people haven't realized it, in addition to those, you know, five that I mentioned, there's 300 more that are now in the marketplace more more choice on the internet yeah Uh, more issues but also more advantages for uh, people that are trying to get into the business right so if you're a startup it's great because now you've got some new options to take a look at because everything in dot com is reserved of course but if you're a business owner with a brand and a trademark already now you've got an expanded set of domain names that that could be an issue roughly how many top-level domains will be launched in 2015? Um, I think there'll be about another 300. In total, there are about 900 uh, TLDs that will launch. Um, So there may be a bit of a delay, but this year, I'd probably say it would be the same as last year, around about 300 or so. There'll be about 600 at the end of 2015, which can create a a headache for a trademark owner, um, but at the same time, like we said, an opportunity for people that are trying to find a good, unique name um, in the domain name space. Okay, so 900 total are going to come out. So 300 last year, 300 in 2015, and then probably 300 in 2016? Yes, that's right. Some of them also branded TLDs, 
that won't be released to the general public. So uh, those are obviously closed to that particular trademark owner. So for instance, if someone applied for a .city uh, group, the bank, they would then reserve it for themselves. Gotcha. So those are large corporations that wanted to have their own top level domain. Exactly. So um, it's not available for, for, for internal for purposes or for just their use um, publicly. Exactly. Okay. So after those 900 come out, are there going to be any more? Do, do, you know, do people who are watching this show need to worry about this issue going forward? Or is it just one that stops at the end of these 900? I would like to say it does stop at the 900, but there, there's talk at ICANN that they will have a second round of applications. So I think people that lost out in the first round applying for their own TLD will have a second opportunity. I'm not too sure when that would happen, um, but there are discussions about that. So there could be more. There could be thousands. Okay. Um, so this issue is not going away with, you know, I can't just stick my head in the sand for three years and hope that this thing just goes away and all these domain names, you know, go defunct. They're going to come out like and then the, more are going to come out after that. You sound like in-house counsel at most oh um, <laughs> uh, large <laughs> corporations. They'll say, let's rather not open a can of worms, but you have to deal with it. And, and that's, you know, the purpose of this discussion, as well as other discussions that are ongoing, is that you, you need to be proactive. You have to know what's out there in order to deal with it. Otherwise, you know, you won't get anywhere. Yeah. And, and what if they're not, what if people aren't proactive business owners, you know, and I, and I mainly want to gear towards small and medium sized business owners because the large corporations are hiring firms like yours to manage these issues for them. They have the resources to do this, to, you know, spend, you know, I don't know, a million, two million or whatever on domain names and buying those is probably nothing compared to their, um, you know, marketing expenses, but it's the small and medium sized businesses that say, do I really need these extra 10, 20, 900 domain names that are going to cost me, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars per year just defensively? It's not bringing in any additional revenue. So, you know, I, what do they have to, what are the, what's the worst case scenario? What do people need to worry about if they just stick their heads in the sand and hope that this all goes away? Well, for a smaller business, it's actually more important because if I'm a small business and I've got my .com or .us, .co.uk domain, that's very important for me. Uh, people find me on the web. Now, if someone registers the identical matching domain, say I'm a, a, a pub, for example, or a bar, and I'm a bar around the corner, and I'll use an example in the UK, Royal Oak, it's a famous pub, it's a small little pub uh, around the corner, now, if someone registers royaloak.pub, people will be confused. There will be a lot of issues. And that really relates to the industry in which that small business operates. So it's very important for the small business owner to be aware of it. And if they do decide to stick their heads in the sand, it could happen that it could affect their business, could divert traffic away to competing sites, to unrelated sites. Um, but obviously, you need to be focused and rather be proactive um, in, in the whole um, approach. Obviously, large corporations do have a lot of money behind them. So if someone does infringe, they can file a UDRP complaint. They can, can take action. For the smaller business, they don't have that amount of money. So if you work out how much a UDRP costs, that cost is far greater than registering a domain name for 10, 20 years. So um, it's not as expensive as you think. And you just have to be strategic and pick the TLDs you want to focus on. Yeah. Okay. And so that's going to be one of the questions that I'm going to ask you later in the show. How do you pick the TLDs? You know, if, if I'm a, a SaaS, software as a service business owner in the accounting space, let's say, that I create invoices for small businesses to use and send to people, you know, what TLDs do I even need to worry about? I'd like that business owner to watch this show and be able to say, okay, I can, I realize that there's a whole bunch of domains, but I really only need to worry about these few. And now after watching Daniel, I know where to go look for them, how to watch when new ones are coming out, how, how to register my trademark to, as a defensive play. And now I've minimized my cost, but I've covered my, my uh, downside. So that's what I'd like them to get out of watching this show. Um, so you and I had a, a chat before this interview is the pre-interview. You basically put together a roadmap for business owners, trademark owners to be aware of. 
Um, and it's a seven step roadmap that we're going to go through one by one. At a high level, it includes filing a trademark, um, filing with the trademark clearinghouse, uh, doing protected mark lists, and, and making sure that your brands are, are protected if necessary, um, focusing on the right top level domains, uh, watching out for sunrise. And we'll talk about what sunrises are uh, in top level domains, looking out for the land rushes, and we'll talk about what the land rush is, and then monitoring your marks on on an ongoing basis. So let's step through them one by one, Daniel. The first step is to file a trademark uh, for your brand. Um, at a high level, what do you and you know you mentioned that you're an attorney to me before the show. I should have said, this is not legal advice. You are an attorney. You're not a practicing attorney. You have practicing attorneys in your firm. Um, if anybody is watching this and they think that they're getting legal advice, they are mistaken and they need to go consult an attorney. Okay, that's out of the way. Um, the first thing that a small business owner should do is determine if they have a trademark, right? And then file it. What do you that recommend that people are aware of uh, with respect to filing a trademark? So for any business, you need to obviously protect your name. And the best way of doing that is through applying for a trademark in the country where you trade. So as a business in the U.S., you would file with the USPTO, the, the U.S. Trademarks Office. You'd file um, a trademark in the class in which you do business or that relates to your particular goods or services. So you would get a trademark registration. It can take about nine months to a year to get the registration. And that's very important, not just from a domain name perspective, but generally you would then have, when the mark proceeds to registration, a registered right to that name. If you don't have that, then it's obviously more difficult to prove your rights. And there's a whole bunch of evidence that you would have to then put forward in order to prove your rights. So it's um, prima facie proof that you do have some sort of um, registered right. So, so that's the first step. All right. Um, so, so as an example, when I launched Domain Sherpa back in late 2010, I wanted to make sure there wasn't another Domain Sherpa out there, that it wasn't confusingly similar. And there wasn't. And I bought the domain name and I named my company that. And then I filed a trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, like you said, because that's where I'm located. Now, people all over the world watch Domain Sherpa, watch these interviews. Do I need to file a trademark in other countries because I have customers or audience in those countries, or is the United States sufficient for me? Well, it's, it's always a difficult question. It's really dependent on how much money you have to spend. Uh, you can file a trademark yourself. I would normally advise someone to consult an attorney. The reason being is you can also file your tax returns um, online, but you're not going to give it to your IT department to do. You give it to your accountant. So in that respect, uh, you need that advice. But I would say file in your primary market first, and then you can extend it to other markets as well. Bearing in mind that trademarks are territorial, so you only get protection in the country where you have your trademark registered. So I would say, for instance, if you are in the US, obviously a US mark, uh, you should apply for that. And then if you deal with the European Union, there is a thing called a CTM, a community trademark, and that is a geographical mark that covers all the um, U um, European Union countries so that you get you file one mark and get protection in all of those countries. Um, but it's very important before you do file that you do a search just to make sure that there are no surprises that someone pops up in, say, Germany or some other country saying, well, I have a, a mark in that country. And then it leads to all sorts of um, legal issues. But the option is there to do that. Excellent. And if people want to do a search in the United States on trademarks, um, the site that I go to is trademark247.com. It's put out by uh, one of our sponsors, uh, Intellium. Um, but you can also go directly to the United States Patent and Trademark Office at TES2, the number two, TES2 at USPTO.gov, I believe. Um, and then if I wanted to search the European Union plus Madrid protocol to find, the, find those countries, What's the, um, the website that I can go to to search those, Daniel? That is Ohim. Um, the exact address I'd have to search for you. Okay. Um, and I can provide that to you after so you can put it on your site. I have uh, WIPO. No, that's not WIPO. I'm, I'm looking at. Is it WIPO.in slash Romarin? Yes, WIPO.int. Um, I-N-T. 
INT. You can find the search on there. They do have quite a comprehensive search. So the Madrid Protocol covers countries that have signed um, um, that are signatories to the Madrid Protocol that allows you to extend marks to certain countries through your home trademarks office. So by the US, you could extend it to certain countries. OHIM, um, I would have to look and see um, and, and find out what what their address is. I don't know it offhand. Um, Oh, it's, um, I've got it over here if you want that. It's oami.europa.eu. Excellent. All right. And, and it's um, a free searchable database. Okay. So that's the first thing to do. You, you have a business, you launch a product or service, you want to trademark that product or service, make it unique, make it yours. You have to file the trademark in the country. That's number one. Number two is now... You know, and, and if you're lucky, you get the exactmatch.com. So if it's, you know, Royal pu- uh, Royal Oaks, like you mentioned, Royal Oak uh, Pub, yeah. maybe they want to get a Royal Oak trademark in the industrial classification for food and beverage. And I'm not sure exactly what that is. So so they own maybe RoyalOak.com if they're lucky. Um, mm. And then they file their trademark in the, the uh, well, actually, they don't. They can be whatever domain name they want, but they want to protect that trademark. Um, so the next step after owning a trademark is to file with the trademark clearinghouse. Now, let's take a step back and can you explain what the trademark clearinghouse is to entrepreneurs and business owners? The trademark clearinghouse is a central re- repository that validates registered trademarks. And what they do is they see that you actually have a registration that you have in fact used the mark, you sign a declaration, you um, submit proof of use that you have used the mark in some way. And what they then do is they validate that you have those rights. Once they do that, they then give you a SMD file, which is a code that allows you to participate in the sunrise period, which you um, previously mentioned, which is the launch period uh, for a new GTLD. So when a new GTLD launches, it will launch with a sunrise, so that trademark owners have a priority period over other um, individuals or businesses so that they can secure their trademarks first. So it's what I can agree to do to give trademark owners some sort of protection in this um, new GTLD program. So that's why it's very important to have a registered trademark. They don't accept trademark applications, as many people might think. So you actually need a registration. Okay. So if I own a trademark for Domain Sherpa, which I do, and I filed with the trademark clearinghouse and, and got approved for domain Sherpa with, with all, in the trademark clearinghouse, then I would have first right to reserve domain Sherpa dot anything that comes out over the next few years or however long I'm paying for the trademark clearinghouse uh, fees. Yes, uh, exactly. But what could happen is maybe someone in South America, maybe Brazil, has got Domain Sherpa as a registered trademark. They can also validate that with the clearinghouse. But then what will happen is if you both apply for, say, Domain Sherpa dot domains, you would then go through an auction. So then you would at least um, have an opportunity to outbid that particular person. But still, it's a priority period. So not so people from the general public can't participate in that period. Gotcha. So it's not a guarantee that I get it and it doesn't come without a cost. The, the you know, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But basically, it's to get at the head of the line for exactly. any new domains that are top level domains that are coming out for me to register my trademark. It puts you in a very good position. That's yeah. It. Okay. And how much does it cost to file a trademark clearinghouse application? It, for a one-year application, it's um, for verification is two hundred and four dollars. And does it go down in price if I register it for you know say three years over you know because they have we have all these new top-level domains coming out? Yes, for three years it's five hundred and ninety-five dollars. Okay. And then with the option to renew it either for a one-year, three-year, or five-year period. Now, I actually filed my own trademark in the United States, I believe. And so I just paid the fees of the uh, USPTO, which um, I want to say was a few hundred dollars, but I can't remember the exact number. It should be around, around about maybe $800, around about 800. that. Okay. Um, I think it might. And if I wanted to pay an attorney to file a trademark on my behalf, 
How much more am I looking to, to spend roughly, Daniel? Well, it really depends on um, where you are, but you could look at about maybe, I'd say, between 1,500 to maybe 3,000, depending on your attorney yep. and the size of the law firm. Yep. Um, so Larger firms typically charge a higher billable rate per hour? That's right. That's right. Okay. And sometimes they may charge you for a search that they will conduct beforehand just so that they can see any pitfalls that you know, you, you, you may experience along the way. Okay, so thanks for filling in those numbers on the trademark. Um, on the trademark clearinghouse application, you said $204 for one year, $595 for, for three years. If I wanted to file it for three years and then I wanted to have a firm like yours also do that filing on my behalf, what roughly, what does it cost? You know, and I'm not holding you to, to firm numbers here, but roughly what would it cost an entrepreneur? Well, well, that is our cost. What we've done is we've incorporated the cost of the trademark clearinghouse into those fees that we've provided. Um, you can go direct, so that would be obviously a little bit cheaper, um, but it's best to go through a trademark clearinghouse agent just because you want to make sure that the information that is being submitted is correct because you have only one chance or opportunity to correct the information. If you don't, you could lose and then have to resubmit, and then obviously that becomes a more costly exercise. Yeah, definitely. I, I find that if I plead ignorance, at least with the USPTO, one of their examining attorneys will take pity on me and, and might give me a little bit of guidance, at least they have in the past. But in this case, you want to get it right. Otherwise, you could lose that application fee. Yes, I've solved a few times on the phone as well. So uh, <laughs> I'm how it works. <laughs> All right. So um, so $595 gets you priority with all the new top level domains coming out. Um, how does a business has, how does a trademark owner decide if they want to get priority? You know, should they file with the trademark clearinghouse to get priority, to pay a higher registration fee before, you know, they, they're open for general availability or should they just watch these new top level domains come out? And if somebody is trying to take advantage of their trademark, then, you know, send them a cease and desist letter and then file a lawsuit. You know, how do they, how do they wrestle with those two things? Uh, 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 what I would suggest first is that obviously through the trademark clearinghouse, what they do do is there's a thing called a claims notification. So if anyone does try and register a domain name that matches the trademark that has been validated at the trademark clearinghouse, the trademark owner would receive notification of that. So there is some sort of watch service for an identical matching mark and variation. So if your mark has a space in it, you can put a hyphen or remove the hyphen. So at least the trademark owner is being notified of that. So you would be aware of an infringement. The person that does register the domain name would see the notice appear when he is registering the domain name. So they can't plead ignorance and say, oh, well, I didn't know that you didn't have trademark rights. So it's there for him to see. They actually see the entry of the actual mark. Um, and then they, you need just to decide what is practical. And, you know, you have to pick your battles. I think you can't spread yourself too thin. You need to see what industry you, you trade in, uh, see what domain names relate to that industry. So like I said, with the Royal Oak, you would look at maybe .pub, .bar, .restaurant, and then you would have to acknowledge that you can't go after everything and someone will register um, a, a mark that um, matches yours because we're obviously living in this global environment and, and it's online. So someone in some country will have a similar mark to yours or an identical mark. Yeah. So it, it's good to focus on your industry and then also look at the generics. There are a lot of generic TLDs that are coming out that have wide application dot club, dot business, dot global, that can really relate to anything. So I would also focus on those because they can be used for anything um, rather than say specific ones like, I don't know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of hand um, um, dot, I don't know, sexy or something like that, which may be specific or dot webcam, something along those lines. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of Small and medium-sized businesses understand that they pay services on a regular basis and $595 for three years to be able to be notified if anybody is registering their trademark and, ever, and any new top-level domain is, is advantageous. You know, you need that information if you're going to manage a process. Um, but the one question that I'm sure entrepreneurs are wondering is, 
does the trademark clearinghouse notify potential registrants, you know, people that are thinking about registering domain Sherpa.club, let's say, does it notify them of just the new top level domains that are coming out? Or does it also tell them, hey, don't register domain Sherpa.net and dot info because there's a trademark on those? No, it doesn't apply to pre-existing TLDs before the new GTLD program launched. So it would be all the new ones. It would be, you know, Doc Club and all the other 900 that will launch. Um, but the person will have to click a button saying that they accept and they acknowledge that there is a trademark owner um, when they do register the uh, domain name. Yeah. So there is that acknowledgement. Okay. So I can didn't, you know, seem to be able to go to all the older general top level domains. No, it would have been very difficult because um, obviously they've been around for a while and yeah. for a lot of pre existing domains. Yeah. I think it would have caused some issues. Okay. So I've got my trademark. I've filed for the trademark clearing house and, and I have my trademark listed in the trademark clearing house now. Um, the next step. Uh, so now if you try to go register domain club, you should be notified that, hey, there is a trademark and you're acknowledging that you're registering this domain name, even though, you know, somebody else has a trademark and it may be infringing. But if I wanted to, as a business owner, prevent you, Daniel, from registering domain club, there's an option called a protected marks list. And how does that work? So three applicants that applied for TLDs, uh, one of them uh, is Donuts, Right Side, and then Minds and Machines. Combined, they applied for around about 300 TLDs. And each of them have introduced this marks protected list. So uh, Donuts and Right Side call it the DPML, which is the Domains Protected Marks List. And Minds and Machines call it the MPML, because in the domain name industry, everyone loves an acronym. <laughs> Um, so I think it's a Minds and Machines Protected Marks list. And what that is basically is you pay, pay a flat fee to protect your matching mark across all their TLDs. So you would pay a fixed fee for five years and donuts would then block your particular mark. So say if I use Lex Synergy as an example, we have a trademark as well. So we would then block Lex Synergy. Then what happens is it's a non-resolving um, domain. And if you search the who is, it will merely say that it's blocked. And then that will prevent people from registering it. Now, the fee that you pay covers a five-year period. So when you work out per unit, it is relatively um, cost efficient to go that route. So what it does do is it includes a lot of TLDs that you may not be interested in, but it also covers some that you may want to register in. So rather than going through the registration process of 100 domains, rather pay that central fee and block it. So you'd have to block it with each of those registries and they each have separate pricing for those blocks. And roughly how much does one of those blocks run? You know, are we talking $100 for five years? Or are we talking $1,000 or $10,000? It's a bit expensive. Um, the donuts one, uh, what we charge is $3,400. And that covers a fair number. I think they will eventually have around about 200 TLDs. If you work out 200 domain names for five years at 3,400, it is relatively low. Um, right side, which has fewer domains, charged $2,600. And then Minds and Machines, which has uh, much less, is about $1,300. Okay. So these are you know, let, let's round up to eight or $10,000. If I'm running a, a large, you know, if I'm running a technology company and my app goes, goes global and people are using it all around the world and it's popular, I'm likely to get a lot of squatters buying my domain name in various top level domains because they think it's cool. They don't realize that there are intellectual property laws that, that I may own the trademark for. And so it just makes sense for $8,000, $10,000 to block 300 plus top level domains and just prevent other people from buying them. Exactly. And the value is in a name. And many people don't understand intellectual property trademarks and they don't understand domain names. And then you combine the two together, which causes greater confusion. So um, if I was a, a startup, I would look at trying to, trying to protect myself as comprehensively as possible because you don't know where it could lead. Say if you use WhatsApp as an example, that 
when it started was a simple messaging service. Now it's grown. I read in the news now that they just under Facebook's number of users, um, or, or they're catching up to Facebook, should I say. Um, so that's a fair number of users. But when they first started, they didn't know where it was going to go. And at least you should take those steps to prevent the identical matching registrations. You obviously can't prevent the person that registers WhatsApp texting dot club or dot com, but at least the identical match you have taken that step. Quick break from three sponsors of today's show. First, are you tired of being upsold and cross-sold when you buy or renew a domain? Then try the newest registrar being built from the ground up with a beautiful interface, competitive pricing, and 24-7 support. Uniregistry.com will surprise and delight you. The right domain can change your life. Uniregistry.com Second, investing in Chinese domains is crazy hard without expert native language advice. Now, as a service to the Western domainer community, TLD Registry offers ChineseLandRush.com. Using ChineseLandRush.com will help you invest in Chinese domains with confidence and without knowing a word of Chinese. Finally, if you're buying a domain name from a private party and want to know what else they own, DomainIQ.com is the tool you should be using. View their entire portfolio, filter by Estebot value, and be a better investor. $49.95 for 250 queries per month. Visit DomainIQ.com slash portfolio to learn more. Yeah, and that's a great example. So WhatsApp um, started as a as a messenger on smartphones, right? So kids right. didn't necessarily want to pay for all the texting fees. And this app came along that allowed them to do everything that SMS texting did, but it didn't cost them anything. They just downloaded this free app and were able to send pictures and videos and text messages to all their friends. Um, they were founded by two former employees of Yahoo. They have over 600 million active users. And then, of course, they were bought by Facebook, I think, for a reported uh, $19 billion. When they started out, they were just this cool little application, right? I think everybody in Silicon Valley and, and in the startup world want to be that cool little application that starts out that has 100 users and then suddenly you know grows exponentially to 10,000 users and 100,000 users. They started out the right way. They bought WhatsApp.com right from the beginning. And that was their main domain name. Um, they may, and I'm not sure if they filed for a trademark. Do you know if they filed in the trademark clearinghouse? Yes, uh, they have filed in the trademark clearinghouse. Okay, so they had a trademark. They filed in the trademark clearinghouse. Did they file for the protected marks lists like donuts and and mines machines and right side? I actually, um, uh, I haven't checked that, but uh, I'd assume that they would have. Um, but at the end of the day, the reason that they were sold for that amount of money that you mentioned was because their house was in order. They had a registered trademark. They could protect it. If you can't protect your name, what's the point? And will someone pay that value for it? And I think not. Um, so that's why it's very important, like Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, all these new, uh, relatively new businesses that have started have unique names that they have protected. So that is the first step, and it does add value. So it's not a wasted expense, but you're building up that intellectual property portfolio. Yeah, great point. All right, so let's say, so we've talked about trademarks, the trademark clearinghouse, and the protected marks list. Let's say that I'm a really small business owner. I'm under, you know, a million dollars in revenue. Maybe I've got a 30% profit margin, so I'm generating $300,000 in free cash flow. Um, but I'm not sure if the, I want to go through the process of a trademark clearinghouse and the protected marks list. If I, but I have a trademark. If I skip those two steps, how can I look at the entire list of top-level domains that are both out and to be released and determine which ones are more appro most appropriate for my small business? And let's let's use an example. You know, a tech business that's say um, doing accounting you know, a, a SaaS software as a service business in the accounting space? Yes. So you can look on the ICANN site, um, um, even our site, like Synergy.com. We do have a list of all the TLDs that have been released or are going to be released. So you can go through and just check off which ones are relevant to your industry. So say if it's dot .accountants, dot .accounting, dot .accountants, sometimes there are plurals in these new TLDs. So you should pay attention to that. 
um, then what you can do is look at which stage you'd want to apply for that particular TLD. So if you don't want to go through the Sunrise, which is more expensive, you can go through the Land Rush. And every new TLD has a different type of land rush. And what a land rush is basically is a period that is just before the, it's released to the general public, but there's a premium charged on the domains to try and make it more exclusive. So you can secure it at that stage or wait for the GA stage, which is the general availability stage, and then register it then at the lower cost. But obviously, as you go down in the stages, there is a higher risk that someone else can snap it up before you. Right. So it's very important that if you are an accountant, you do uh, your, you register um, your mark.accountant at the sunrise, and then say you want to get maybe a more generic one, do that at the um, land rush. So if you want to get maybe California.accountant, you would then try to get that at the land rush uh, stage. Because there are obviously a lot of generics that are very good for your industry. You may want to get that um, at that stage. Okay, that makes sense. So if I'm running an accounting service online, let's let's call it PayMe.com. I have no idea if it's an actual business or not, but I, we generate invoices. I'm going to go to LexSynergy.com, check out all the domain top level domains that have been released, all the ones that are coming out. I'm going to look through this list and I'm going to say PayMe.horse. That's probably not going to be uh, one that I need to worry about. Pay me dot accountant, yes. Pay me dot accountants, yes. Why they launched those is another topic. Um, pay me dot accounting, uh, um, maybe pay me dot online. I might want to think about. Yes. That's right, and then also you can look at maybe high risk ones. There's dot review dot reviews. Maybe you might be a bit worried that someone might say something about your business. Um, they might review your accounting package, so that's important. There's also other ones like .gripe, .sucks, .wtf, um, .lol. So there are a, a lot out there that maybe you might want to register defensively, but that's really a question of cost. Yeah, and if I'm a really small business owner, maybe I'm just going to forego those because I don't have a lot of people complaining. But if I'm, say, a yeah. uh, four, five, ten million dollar revenue business, I might want to actually control those types yes. of TLDs. And, and also, um, what must be remembered is that a lot of geo TLDs are coming out. So that's like .london, .nyc, .vegas. And sometimes you can trade within that area. So you can then also secure a localized one that may increase eventually um, your search engine ranking as the search engines pick up these new TLDs. Yep. So say if you're based in London, you'd want to go for maybe accountant.london, and then you, know, you could optimize that particular site. That makes and sense. Okay, so I've looked through the TLD list. I know which ones um, are top priority and which ones are sort of second priority, and then there's like hundreds of other TLDs that I, that I may or may not care about. Um, yes. If I filed the trademark clearinghouse and I want, you know, pay me dot accountant accounting accountants um i can then um be first in line to try and register those uh during the sunrise period yes exactly so what would happen is they would give you that smd file we, uh, i mentioned and that allows you to register during the sunrise so it's very important that you keep that also um, secure um, as a registrar, we keep that for our clients just because you don't want people getting the, the uh, file because then they can register domain names in, in your name. Um, and then that's what you would use during the sunrise period. And if, and if the average price of the new top level domains is about $25, let's say, like if I go to GoDaddy and I do a search for pay me and it shows me all the available domain names, let's say that's about $25. How much am I likely to pay for my trademark in the sunrise period, even after I paid for my trademark clearinghouse, uh, you know, opportunity to register it early. Am I paying about $25 or more? No, it, it's, it, it can be uh, much more than that. It really depends on the TLD. In the sunrise phase, some charge around about $100, $150 during the sunrise. Um, others can be substantially more depending on um, the jurisdiction. For instance, Dot Vin and Dot Tyrol, which um, are um, provinces in Austria, were over a thousand dollars. 
So that can be quite expensive, but then there are others that are more cost effective. So some of them are about the more generic ones around about a hundred to hundred and fifty dollars. So I'm gonna gripe right now because I'm a business yes. owner and I'm sure business owners are watching this saying, Why are registries, you know, the companies that are launching these new top level domains and selling these these domain names under their new top level domain, uh, charging more if I'm a trademark owner and I have a right to register that domain name? Well, trademark owners have that right as well, not just uh, smaller businesses, because you have taken that effort to protect your rights. These registry operators are aware of it and they need to recover costs in some way. So they have put a premium on it and they normally know that trademark owners would fork out that amount of money to protect and to have that priority period. So it's in exchange for giving them a priority period, you have you are in a way compensating the registry for that. They've had to implement systems in that they have to integrate their system with the trademark clearinghouse. The registrar has to do that. So, so many people are involved in the process to make it work that that has increased the costs. But I do agree with you, it is unfair. Yeah. And, um, so I'm not just transferring the money that I might have to pay to defend squatter against squatters to registries that are doing it. They actually have an additional cost to try and implement this new system. and. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you look at it, say you're paying $100 for a Sunrise, a UDRP complaint, which is a domain name dispute complaint, that costs $1,300 to file. Yeah. So um, it is a tenth of the price yeah. um, if you compare it. All right. So if I filed my trademark clearinghouse, that gives me an opportunity to pay more money for the registration during the Sunrise period and get in before anybody else can do that. If I... Um, do not pay for the trademark clearinghouse, then I cannot get in on the sunrise period of registrations. The next period that comes after sunrise is called land rush. And that's when anybody can register a domain name, but it comes at a higher cost. So it's not the cost that you see on GoDaddy and, and uh, uh. register.com and, you know, the, the general availability costs. It's a land rush you you know you're paying more to get the best land and and those types of costs i've seen range from you know 150 dollars up to tens of thousands of dollars depending on the domain exactly some of them some of the registry operators uh have a, they call it the early access period but it's similar to a land rush so on the first day it would be ten thousand dollars the next day it drops down to around about seven and five until it reaches around about a hundred dollars that's correct yeah, so, you know, and these are generally serving generic words. So let's say that uh, attorney.nyc, if you want to be the preeminent attorney in New York City, or you want to be, you know, accident.auto, um, you're going to pay more for those types of keywords because a lot of advertising is in those markets. They, you know, understand that those domain names come at a premium and they're willing to sell them, but they're going to let the market decide. And if you're willing to pay, 10,000 for it on day one, let's say it's going to drop to 8,000 on day two and all the way down, you know, under after, I don't know how many days, eight, 10 days, it drops down to general availability pricing of $25, let's say. Okay. Um, and in some cases, it actually doesn't drop down to the regular registration fee. It will yes, actually it stay at, at a raised at a higher amount. Yeah. So that's the land rush. Um, and anybody can participate in land rush. So if I didn't do the trademark clearinghouse and I didn't do the protected marks list, I could say, well, I'm really only, I really only care about a couple of top level domains. I'm going to wait for land rush, see what the price is. Maybe it'll be low. I'll get lucky and register it for, you know, uh, uh, a non uh, escalated price. Um, but maybe I'll just pay a few hundred bucks and be done with it. Yes, you can take that approach. And um, if it's not as important to you as other um, domain names, then I'd say th that is a, a good approach. But some registry operators do have a first come first serve uh, land rush and others have an application. So at the end, it's allocated to the um, applicant. If there's more than one, then it goes through to an auction on the first come first serve, you'll get it straight away. So you'd also need to find out if it's first come first serve or application. Because with application, you're not in a rush. As long as you submit within that, a certain period, you are okay. With first come, first serve, you obviously need to make sure that you're submitting it as soon as it opens. Yeah. Okay.
that makes sense. Um, and then after the land rush period, it then goes to general availability. So that's just regular pricing. You go to uh, your favorite registrar, you type in the domain name with the extension, it comes back and says, maybe it's available, maybe it's not. If it's available, they give you the pricing. That is general availability pricing. Yes, that's where the chaos begins. <laughs> and why do you say that, Daniel? No, um, depending on what type of business you are, we've seen a lot of people trying to exploit um, the new system by squatting on domains. The reason being is some people think just because a trademark owner hasn't secured it, uh, a particular domain, say it's WhatsApp.CapeTown, they think that that means they can register it. They normally come back if we send a cease and desist to them, they'll say, well, it was available, they didn't take up the, uh, the domain, so we decided to register it. And many people feel that they've lost out on the .com um, land grab. So now they have, you know, different TLDs to focus on and do that. In. Yeah, exactly. And it's rampant in countries where intellectually, intellectual property law isn't as strong as in the United States or the uh, European Union. So, you know, you could have uh, a person register WhatsApp in China for a new top level domain, you can send them a cease and desist letter, but you know, China doesn't protect intellectual property as strong as the US does. So you're almost out of luck by sending them a cease and desist letter or trying to file a, a legal action in the United States. Well, well, not necessarily because the UDRP governs all new GTLDs. So it is a little bit different to uh, country code top level domains like .c in which, which can get a bit difficult to, to litigate in. But with the, the new GTLDs, you can go via the UDRP, so you can file a complaint um, at the uh, National Arbitration Forum in Minnesota. And if you are successful, then you can get the transfer of the domain. So a jurisdiction won't really play a role in it. What may play a role is if they use the Chinese registrar and the language of the agreement is Chinese, you would have to file your complaint in Chinese. Hmm. So um, you may have to do that, but at least you do have a mechanism available to recover your domain name. Yeah, so if WhatsApp didn't file the protected marks list and somebody in China registered WhatsApp.webcam, let's say, yes. and, uh, and they used a Chinese registrar that was in Chinese, WhatsApp or Facebook, I guess, could file a UDRP or URS. And, and if people aren't familiar with those, they can search on Domain Sherpa for UDRP and URS and find out more about that legal course of action that's administer, administered by, the, by uh, a few different bodies, including the National Arbitration Forum. Uh, and for a certain amount of money plus legal fees, they can have a panel of one to three lawyers review this case and determine if somebody is cyber squatting it is taking advantage of their trademark um and uh and you're saying that if it is with a chinese registrar they would need to file the udrp and have it translated into chinese as well in this particular case well depending what um forum you choose if you choose wipo they tend to allow you to argue to have the complaint heard in say english Say if you were corresponding with a cyber squatter, he was replying to you in English, the website was in English, you can argue that he had a sufficient understanding of the language so that you can communicate in English and it would prejudice you to file in Chinese. But with the National Arbitration Forum, they don't allow you to do that. So you have to file the complaint, put the argument in there, but you still then have to submit a Chinese translation. Um, so there are services out there that translate them into Chinese. So um, it adds to the cost, but it is possible still to file. That makes sense. All right. Well, I think we've gone through the entire process uh, for from trademark to to protecting them. It's sort of a a risk assessment, you know. I, I uh, um, you know, whenever I think of attorneys, they're always going to take the most conservative, you know, path to any type of legal issue I have, unfortunately, because that protects them and it protects the client. But but basically, in, in any risk assessment, you want to identify the hazards, analyze and evaluate that the risk of that hazard, and then determine appropriate ways to eliminate or control the hazard. In this case, if WhatsApp is the trademark, 900 new top level domains plus going forward are the hazards, cyber squatters could register them and then analyzing all the new top level domains and figuring out which ones 
are most likely to add confusion to allow a cyber squatter to get benefit from your trademark um, are, is what needs to be analyzed. And then, you know, determining ways to eliminate it. We talked about filing with the trademark clearinghouse, which notifies anybody that's registering domain names that there is a trademark. So notification step one, blocking them with, with these protected mark lists, marks lists that you described. Um, uh, you know, registering any domains that aren't on the DPML list uh, during the sunrise period and getting those out of the opportunity for cyber squatters to register, and then monitoring domain names. If if people want to monitor, because you know, let's say I own domain Sherpa, the the trademark clearinghouse is only going to notify me when somebody registers an exact match. But what if I wanted domain Sherpa CN dot com? And I wanted to be notified if my trademark was being used within a domain name. Are there services to use to, to monitor that as well, Daniel? Yes. So, so companies like, like Synergy and other uh, brand protection companies do offer watch services like that, which go beyond um, the identical match. So like you say, it would be a word incorporating your mark. So domain Sherpa, domains.com, sometimes even a misspelling on the QWERTY keyboard, mm. QWERTY keyboard keyboard, all the common misspellings, the WW before the mark, some people register that without the dot. So, you know, if someone mistypes it very quickly in a browser, they can go to another site. So there are search um, and watch services that um, they can um, subscribe to. Some of them are can be uh, expensive, but um, it, it's good to know what's out there. And uh, at least you can then make an informed decision of how you will tackle these disputes. Yeah. And also, I think keeping up to date with the new GTLD program is as it develops, we'll see which TLDs are popular. As you can see now, dot club has become very popular. Um, others, such as dot HIV, has only got about 300 registrations. So you would look at that and say, well, that's relatively low risk. I'm not going to focus on that particular TLD. And then as time goes on, you would see which ones are performing. And then those are obviously high risk ones. And you can maybe focus on those as opposed to just trying to get out there and register everything, which is impossible. Yeah. And if you go to Google and type in NGL, I'm sorry, go into Google and type in NGTLD stats um, as two separate words, uh, it'll take you to a website I th that I, I can't remember the exact. Yeah, I think it's NTLD uh, stats dot com. Dot com. That will um, give you all the number of registrations to date by TLD, so you can quickly get a feel for which ones might be of concern and which ones probably aren't of concern. Um, so that's a great point, Daniel. That is the seven step process that entrepreneurs, business owners, trademark owners need to be aware of. Did did I leave anything out? Did are there any final pieces of advice that you have for? trademark owners as they're looking forward uh, looking forward towards these launches and need to protect their their uh, intellectual property I think it's very important that they are proactive that they that they're keeping up to date with the system um, if they don't have trademarks to speak to an attorney to at least structure that so that they have that protection mechanism available to them and also as the program evolves, keeping and making sure that their applications or submissions are um, suitable, that they don't go overboard. Because we've seen it with a few clients um, and also in the media, um, I think it was with um, the mayor of New York, with .NYC, he went crazy registering all these variations and that was a publicity nightmare. Um, so, you know, just being um, conservative in the approach, obviously, like you mentioned, no attorney, um, wants any risk, so they will tell you to register as much as possible. But really, you need to be sensible about the whole process. And I think common sense must prevail. Yeah. And if I do have an intellectual property lawyer uh, attorney that files my trademarks and my patents, is that attorney necessarily the best one to manage my domain name um, intellectual property as well? Some uh, brand owners like having their trademark uh, um, attorneys involved just because they have a broader um, outlook on uh, intellectual property and they know where their trademarks are sitting and what they need to do to prevent or to mitigate the risk. So they'll be familiar with their um, 
um, risk. So if they litigate a lot in China, they'll say focus on the Chinese IDN um, extensions, and they can provide that invaluable advice in developing a strategy like we do when we sit down with a client. We don't just say randomly say register this. We give them a list and say to them, this is what you need to do. This is how you go about it. And this is what you should focus on. And I think you do need that input. Um, but it also comes down to a cost. You know, there is a premium sometimes that is charged if you do go through an attorney. Yeah. And I, you know, I guess the point that I was trying to get at, which I'll just say, because I'm, I'm sure that you're trying to be uh, politically correct, is that not all attorneys know about domain names and yeah. how the process works. I don't necessarily want to have to pay for my IP attorney to learn the trademark clearinghouse process, to learn the protected marks list and to, um, you know, understand the tools that are necessary to track new domain name registrations, even in .com to notify me um, like you can use at domaintools.com. So there are tools out there. There are processes out there. Um, you know, clearly you are uh, um, uh, intelligent on this process and, and well-spoken. So, you know, I'm not giving a pitch for Lex Synergy, but you can do that. You can work yes. with an intellectual property attorney that I may have that doesn't have that expertise and, and, you know, focus on the things that you know best. Exactly. And I think the domain name industry is evolving. And if someone isn't keeping up to date with it, as maybe some attorneys aren't, then um, it could lead to, to some issues or higher costs. So yeah. um, there, there are services like ours and others that you can uh, use to try and at least minimize that cost and get professional advice. Yep. Great. If you're watching the show and you have questions about trademarks and protecting them, with respect to the new top level domains that are coming out, please post your questions in the comments below this video on Domain Sherpa, and I'll ask Daniel to come back and answer as many as he can. I also encourage you to take a moment and post a quick thank you to Daniel in the comments, you or use the button below to, to uh, thank him on Twitter. Um, I'm gonna be the first to do so right now because I've learned a lot during our hour conversation, Daniel, and I really appreciate you walking us through your seven-step process. Daniel Greenberg, director at Lex Synergy Limited. Thanks for coming on the Domain Shipper Show, sharing your insights of how entrepreneurs can effectively and cost-efficiently protect their brands, and thanks for being a Domain Sherpa for others. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.